Hello, Steve. How are you? Hello, Michael. What's happening, my friend? Not too much. I'm pretty sure. good. You all right? All right. Everything's great. You feeling better this week? I am very much so. I'm glad to hear good. it. Good. We got a great guest today. Really great guest. Except we're almost done with this podcast. What could be? What could be wrong? There's light at the end of the tunnel. As there certainly is. <laughs> Been a long tunnel. Well, I mean, really, we don't. The, our guest really needs no introduction. And uh, if you watch this podcast, you know exactly who this person is, um, and have spent lots of time in her office, <laughs> as we have. Uh, born in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, grew up on Long Island, moved to France after high school, worked as a fashion model, has appeared in over 60 films and TV series, including somewhat, someone, someone to Watch Over Me, Basketball Diaries, Medicine Man, Radio Flyer, I Married a Mobster, Rizzoli and Isles, Blue Bloods. Her big break was playing Karen in Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas. She's been nominated for an Oscar for four Emmys and for, for four Golden Globes. 71 episodes as Dr. Melfi on The Sopranos. Please welcome Lorraine Bracco. Hey, Lorraine. Welcome back, Lorraine Bracco. This is Hi, guys. How are you? Hello, Lorraine. Thanks for doing this. Good to see you, as always. Good to see you. So we're down to just a handful of episodes of the podcast, and we're talking about, we call it, me and Michael call it season seven. Uh, okay. you know, I know uh, HBO calls it season six, but we're down to a handful. And we want what I want to know is how did you feel? So, right, we had the we, we finished season six, we had the big contract negotiation, and then we all went back to work. And uh, this was it, it was going to be nine more and out. So, what were you feeling? What was your feeling at that time? Well, I was always sad, you know, that it was the end. I mean, it was just such a great run. It was such a great uh, uh, cast and writing. I mean, it really, 20 years later, we can honestly say that it has withheld its uh, its beauty, right? Oh, absolutely. It, it's oh, yeah, it all the time. beauty. It's, I mean, it's, it's high regarded. And so, I mean, uh, I was sad that, you know, we didn't do more. It was always, you know, a fab I loved it because I, I got to work in New York and live in New York. That was a big thing for me. I was really happy about that. But um, as I think back, I remember being upset the, the, the direction that David was bringing Melfi. Which I was felt what? I, I just felt that, you know, he, he wanted he wanted me to get rid of him. I felt that he did it in a very abrupt way. I don't think that, you know, she should have done it that way. Um, uh, Kupferberg was this when he turned around and did the whole um, Jeopardy. Bah, 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 bah. Is that when he did that to me yeah. in that in those last episodes? I, I felt really bad that he outed me at the dinner. I felt that was really wrong. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. that's the that's the therapist in me, <laughs> the yeah. actor therapist in me. And, um, you know, I would have liked it to have been more um, more meaningful. I mean, I think she she cared for Tony. Sure. She did not, you know, even though he was a fuck up and that maybe he was never going to really uh, straighten out. But I think she cared for him. Sure. You know, you don't spend seven years with someone. And, you know, and discard them. I, I felt bad about that. Yeah, I think Do part you... of it was they were trying to he was really trying to paint Tony as having really gone morally corrupt like the cum cumulative effect of all his wrongdoings finally kind of came to fruition in this last season okay but wouldn't it have been great to have had him say that to her fuck you i'm doing what i'm doing maybe i don't i don't care what you say to me i don't care morally where you want to try to guide me or whatever i mean i think that would have been powerful 
Yeah. Do you, so Lorraine, do you think Melfi, I know early on, but do you think uh, was sexually attracted to him even at the end? No. No? Was I did business, not. All business. All business? I didn't. I never brought into that room any sexuality. I had to void myself of, you know, any of those feelings, any big movement. You know, they were very, very, David was very strict about, you know, how she comported herself, which was very hard for me because, as you see, (laughs) you were very still, very, very, very very still, very still. But compared to him, remember, he's the catalyst. He's telling the story. He's the one. So, and and if, if all of a sudden it started to be more like me, if I brought yeah. me in, the, it would never have worked. Right. Then we would have been fucking on the table. I'm sorry. Yeah. Did I just right. say that? <laughs> you can say that. You can say yeah, anything no, on this to... podcast. Steve, Steve said it the last episode, actually. I don't know about oh. what. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, that's that's really interesting because, you, you know, there was always with the audience, will they, won't that, you know, there's that kind of, uh, you know, the sexual tension because he, you know, flat out propositions you a couple of times, you know, and wants to make it a conquest, thinks he has feelings, but, you know. But know. for him, it was a conquest. It was never, you know, uh, and I'm, by the way, very, very, very often that is in therapy. Sure. It, it is a it is a given fact that there are you know uh, sexual and love feelings towards your therapist. It's it's normal. I also think that Tony always wanted what he couldn't have. Of course, he wanted what fruit. Christopher had with Juliana. He wanted what other people had. Always, That's you know, right. one of those guys always looking in the other guy's pocket. You know, right? So yeah. it's the forbidden fruit. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a See, when I went to therapy, I picked a therapist that looked like Steve. This way, I know that would never be an issue. <laughs> I want to pick someone that I know I would never, 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 never want to get down with. I yeah. was his therapist. Never mind. <laughs> Look like him. I was his therapist. <laughs> but you know, it's so funny because I remember talking to David in the beginning, and I said. Tony is not going to talk to anybody that doesn't feel like neighborhood. Yeah. 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 And Even I think the fact was, that he was a woman helped, right? That, oh, that you were a woman helped. Yes. Oh, for sure. There was no doubt about that because he immediately felt the, the male uh, in him uh, and, and not threatened. He wasn't threatened by her. Yeah. He would have. He was threatened by her intelligence. Sure. Yeah. 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 But not by her. Yeah. Right. Well, I loved uh, I loved about Melfi that she she fucking antagonized him. She broke his balls. A lot of times, Melfi jabbed at soft spots there. You know, you hit his wick a lot of times. You didn't just sit back and listen, listen, listen. Well, you that's know? David Chase. <laughs> All right, Lorraine. So your last your last episode, Melfi's last episode was Blue Comet, episode twelve. You weren't in the finale, like I wasn't. But yeah. yet we all watched it together down yeah. in Florida. Yeah. Now, I know you went to the last read-through, which I didn't. Uh, I should have went. And I don't know. what Did you go, Michael? I don't remember. I didn't go to the last read-through. I remember you going and asking me if I was going, Lorraine. And for some reason, I don't I guess no one invited me, so I didn't go. Uh, but when it went to black, Finally, were you surprised at it or you knew, you know, I knew what was going to happen. I was still surprised. What was your feeling? Um, well, I had seen the the show before we were all in Florida. So I knew. You uh, saw it? Yes. How'd that happen? I, uh, You're not uh, going to tell? Come on. The girls got to keep some later. secrets. Oh, my God. So Michael, I did knew you see it. it too? What? Did you, did you see, see it all? No, I had not seen it until the till it aired. No. So wow, I, that is a something I had no idea. I you saw it before it aired. 
I did. Wow. Well, I'm special. She hired Chris Albrecht to put it on the air. She called him up and said, what are you doing? This is a great show. Wow. That's true. I did do that. Um, so probably not many people were privy to that. You, David, no. Martin, Bruce Lee. Not yeah, many not a lot of I know. I know. So anyway, I mean, part of me says, well, it was David Chase's genius that we're still talking about this and confused about it 25 years later. And the other part says to me, you know, David saying, okay, fuck you, nighty night. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't have, you know, there's, there's a million ways to go. Did the guy kill him with the uh, membership? What was it? The members only uh, uh, jacket? Who knows? Who knows? But, um, you know, the genius is, is that we're still talking about it. So for that, bravo, David. So you have no you have no opinion either way if he's alive or dead? No. None. What you see is what you get. That's your thing. That's it. What? Um, what do What's you yours? I think I, he's alive. Michael? I go back and forth all the time. You know, first I thought he was dead. Then I, I kind of revised that and think he's alive. He's alive. Then I thought it doesn't matter. What you see is what you get. Now I'm leaning towards he's dead. Because of I'm now rewatching it really closely because we're doing the lap. We're breaking down the last season. Yeah. There's so many references to like things hanging over his head. The, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. There's a piano hanging over my head. You know, Carmelo always saying what's going to happen. What's going to happen. You know, there's just a lot of. The whole the whole coma shit and him seeing, you know, the afterlife. I mean, it just seems like we're heading towards that. Um, but I think the reality is probably more what you what you say. What you see is what you get. There is no answer. And David's never said, I don't know. I don't even know what David says anymore because it's. <laughs> he doesn't yeah, really I mean, you know, it, 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 it was left up to all of our personal yeah. interpretation of uh, the, the, the surmise of The Sopranos, right? Because yeah. one interview, David said that it was a death scene. And then he kind of backpacked, ba backpedaled a little bit. Yeah. And well, then when we had him on, I don't remember, what did he say exactly when we had him he on? He shuffled. He gave us the shuffle. He didn't. He says, every time I'm asked that, I put my foot in my mouth. I mean, he's coming off for the finale. We'll ask him again. Uh, but this is my thing. If they kill Tony, they kill maybe not the whole family, but they kill yeah. members of the family. They didn't yeah. just kill Tony. Maybe. You know, they, he, he was sitting next to his, you know, his wife and daughter and son. Somebody yeah. else died. Well, that's a horrific thought, but okay. It the, just one way. And you wouldn't have wanted to see that on camera. No. No. That would have been awful. But, you know, again, I, I think that uh, uh, the way David knew that that was the music he was going to use, I think David is very, you know, methodical in his thinking. He's very specific. Ultra, ultra specific. Ultra, right. No one's more specific than David. I agree. Yeah, he won't give us an answer. He was shuffling a little bit, and and maybe he won't on, on maybe on his deathbed. <laughs> and maybe he shouldn't. Maybe that's. I mean, he probably shouldn't. You know, you know, and, Alan Taylor. Came, Alan Taylor came forward and says he thinks he died. That's right. But okay, what does he know? know? It's 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 like everyone. Every everybody's has an asshole. And they have an opinion. Yeah. So oh, there you go. <laughs> David directed the last episode, so so even so even the directors can't really chime in because they didn't. Who do gives it. a shit? I wasn't in it. No, I'm teasing. Nor was I. You know, Lorraine, where do you think Melfi? He got rid of me. Where do you where do you think Melfi is? You know, where was she five years after the show ended? Yeah, she was working. Did she? Personally, she, did she get together maybe with Kufferberg, her and Elliot? 
No. Stop stupid. No. Stop Elliot. No. No. Because of you know, Can I tell you? I don't know if I said this to you on the first time we talked. This. You know that I begged David to play my husband. I on didn't the know that. Really? I begged him. <laughs> I begged David. You wanted to, play to have a sex husband. scene with David. You were going to have a sex well, scene with David? They, I don't know if David would have been up for it, but <laughs> he might have not been interested. But um, uh, I begged him. I said, you're the husband. Play my husband. Be my husband. Play him. Play him. It's a small role. And he said, no, he was too busy writing, editing, blah, 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 blah. And he wouldn't do it. That would have been really interesting. Thank you very much. No. Not just a pretty face. <laughs> that would have been really interesting. Thank you. I thought it would have yeah. been great. It was her, it was her Svengali. Yeah. He made a mistake and, and I have such deep love for him that I think it would have been really interesting. Yeah. I well, tried. We've never really seen him act though. It's okay. I could. It wasn't. Wasn't like he was gonna, you know, do fucking Shakespeare. No, but maybe he just doesn't want it. Maybe you know. He could have done it. We could have got him through. I, I would think he could, right? Because yes, he's very super talented. But maybe he didn't feel. It. No, no, he was do it enough. because he said he was too busy writing. He was he editing. Was. La, 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 la. I beg. I must have called him four times on it. But you know what? I think when you're. You know, like Terry, you know, had a small role, and even Eileen, Matt, and Andrew, Matt Weiner. And Matt Weiner, and they all did a good job. And I, David, as a writer, his imagination, director, I'm certainly, I'm sure he could have done it. Yeah. Me too. You know. I, I'm, I, I, I was convinced with it. I'm still convinced. That would have been really interesting. <laughs> Lorraine, uh, what would yeah. you have done different? Anything would you have done different as Melfi if you had to do it over again? Or as Lorraine, just your experience or your approach or your, your, I don't know. Again, I don't, I didn't like the way he ended it. Oh, you know, no. I felt that that was rough. It was abrupt. Uh, um, you know, uh, I would have liked um, if he had come in with Carmela more often. That would have been fun. That would have been fun. I would have liked if he brought the kids in with him. I always wished he would bring Christopher in to help him with the drug drug pro. I think that would have been one of the funniest scenes. I mean, I would have liked that because <laughs> you know, often in therapy, you do bring in your loved ones or yeah. people who are important to you, and I think that could have been very interesting. Sure, or turn people on to a therapist. I've done that in the past. You know, recommended. Someone to he could have brought his gomadas in. Good. All could together have. at one time. By the way, she knew. I didn't. I know. Uh, what's her face? Yes. Gloria. Gloria. Uh, um, was your, your patient. Yeah. Your... Gloria. Yes. Yes. Annabella. Yeah. She knew Annabella. Sure. She knew her very well. Yeah. You know, that to me would have been interesting. That would have been unusual, different, not what you expect. Um, but hey, Lorraine, at the beginning of the show, you were the only known actor for the most part, certainly by the audience. You had Michael Imperioli. By yeah, the but, audience. But, the audience uh, you knew were Michael, but you know what I mean. You okay, had okay. been nominated for an Oscar. You know, okay, you were kind blah, of blah, the blah. only name. Seriously. Okay. Yeah. Well, what? How was that? What was that like? You were kind of the, you know. Well, I can only thank Sheila Jaffe and uh, uh, George Ann Walken, who forced me to read the script because I had a rule, no more mob stories. I didn't care. I didn't want to do it. I, was, I did it already. You know, I was handed 400 mob stories after Goodfellas. And I know I'm not doing it. I don't want to do it. I'm not reading, not reading, not reading. And Sheila Jaffe, who was casting, 
literally called me up and said, listen, this guy wants to meet you. Read it. Please just come in. Let him meet you. He just wants to meet you. And I was like, Sheila, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Please, Lorraine, please. And finally, I just, she wore me down. I read it. And that's when my whole, uh, my whole inside changed because I hadn't read anything like that. It was so different and unusual. And of course, I said to everyone, I, he, he wants to meet me for Carmela. And I said, I don't want to play Carmela. I want to play Melfi. And they were like, don't tell him that. Don't tell him anything. Just come. <laughs> it's funny, right? Great instinct, though. Really great instinct. A good thing that you held your ground, that's for sure. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that Sheila really, you know, forced me to read it and come in. Now, one more time. If you were being tortured, bamboo under your fingernails, and you had to give an answer, is Tony Soprano alive or dead, Lorraine? What the fuck do I know? I don't think she's with Tony, Steve. I think she's just... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> nobody knows. You know, I never... Well, David knows. David Chase did knows. Did you ever feel like he was threatened? That the, that, that there was a threat there? Yeah. I did. Definitely. I mean, uh, you know, the tension was building up with uh, Meadow parking. No, but, with Bill. Uh, what do you mean? From the New York family, there was a lot of tension. Listen, he's alive and well. He's eating onion I, rings. He's in and I'm sorry. Building. But, that's I'm sorry. I'm the mafia is not going to kill you in front of your wife and kids. I want to believe that there's some kind of code. No, no. I'm not saying that they wouldn't do it, but they would also have no choice but to kill them. So that means they wipe out the family, and I don't, you know, I don't want to think that thought either, I guess. What do I know? I only know what Michael tells me. I'm like <laughs> right. the ventriloquist. I'm the dummy. That's it. That's how it works. Here. <laughs> That's how it works. Lorraine, I don't, I don't think, think they would have I don't think much. they would have shot him with the family there, the no, kids. Um, I don't no, know. but we've not there, there's a code, no. I don't know if there's a code about that. I don't know. They killed <clears throat> they killed Phil's brother in cold blood. I don't know if Phil wouldn't give a shit. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. I agree. And they killed Joe Gallo. Wasn't he with his wife and family? I think so. I don't know. And Umberto, so I don't think that's at the point. But, well, Didn't they kill him outside? Yeah. <laughs> thank you do very you believe, much. Do you believe this is the conversation? <laughs> no. Yeah, it happened. There you go. 14 years later. We're still Part of it. Thank you very Part much. The conversation. Thank you, Lorraine. Thanks for coming on. We'll we love having you. Home. I That's love you both. Thank you. Love you. Thank Have you fun. very much. Appreciate it a lot. You Good luck well. finding the answer to the end of the Sopranos. Yeah, we need it. We need Buena it. fortuna. <laughs> Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. There you go. Can't get an answer out of Lorraine Bracco about what happened. I think she has an answer. Always good to see her. Uh, she doesn't have, well, listen, I know no one has the answer, but they have their opinion. Like you have yours. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I think Alan Taylor, he doesn't know any more than anyone else, but yet he's in oh. the press saying it. So, you know, he doesn't know. that's his opinion. That's his opinion. That's true. All right. Uh, let's take, a, let's take a break and get into the episode. Yes, sir. Hey, Michael. Hey, Michael. Hey, Willie. Say hello to Uncle Michael. Hi, hello. Willie. How are you? Hi, Uncle Michael. It's hello. been a while. He's got his uh, sweatshirt on. It's, you know, getting cold here in New York. But he's all ready. But I, I want to bring something up, Michael. Uh, you know, uh, we've talked about the movie The Many States of Newark, of course. But now the Associated Humane Society of Newark and the Trenton Falls Humane Society are offering the Many States of Newark dogs. For adoption. That's what they're calling these dogs. If you're looking for a dog, this is the place to go. 
They have a lot of beautiful, well-behaved, lovable dogs just waiting to be adopted. So pick up your little saint today. Call 732, it's in Jersey, 922-0100 or more information. Uh, description below, my niece, Lorraine Costello, is involved with them, and it's a really great organization for the dog. So, uh, great, 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 you great. Know? So uh, please check that out, folks. All right? Okay, yeah, season seven, episode six, Kennedy and Heidi, uh, first aired May thirteenth, two thousand seven. Uh, listen, uh, uh, we everybody knows pretty much this is my last episode of The Sopranos. Yeah. So I've made a decision. I think this should be my last episode of the podcast. Okay, you're out. Well, now, I think I think we should follow the footprint. No. Okay, so now do you want me to? Con- Continue with someone else or just go solo? That's up to you, Steve. Who would, who would you want as your replacement? Um, Andy? Drunken Andy you're going to leave me with? He's a fucking booze hound. I don't know. Maybe Willie. Willie boy. Yeah, you guys look good together. Willie's my man. He it's loves a, you. He's licking you. Adopted, he kisses you. It's my adopted son. Sleeps with me every night. I don't know. I don't know how I can go on. I mean, my character's out. We, we're following kind of the I, show. I, I think you can do it. I think you were great in this episode. Uh, honestly, I think you were great. It's a great episode. All of these nine are Yeah, fantastic. yeah. It is, a, it is a really good episode. Written by Matt Weiner. Um, 11 out of the 12 that he did with David Chase. Matt Weiner and David Chase wrote this together. They were nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Writing of a Dramatic Series. Directed by Alan Taylor. Eight of his nine. He won the Emmy for this episode for Best Director. And now, were you nominated Were you nominated uh, for this episode? Do you know? Um, I don't remember. I don't remember. I think so, yeah. I lost to... Uh, Oh, William lost, Shatner again? No, I lost to the guy from Lost. I forgot his name. Sorry. Uh, no offense. Not really. Um, you're not. You're not sorry. And fuck him. It was it. It's over. He won. You did. He, he should won. Be I don't remember. I never saw you. the. I never saw the show. I never uh, saw Lost either. The original title or the working title of this episode was Sonia, which is the name of the character played by uh, Sarah uh, Shahi. Um, Sonia means wisdom. Is it Shahi or Shahi? Oh, sorry, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, Shahi, Shahi, Shahi. Sorry. Whatever. Tomato, Sarah, tomato, 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 tomato. Shahi, Shahi. I think it's Shahi. I think you're right. Uh, who's very good in this episode? I really liked what she did. But Sonia means wisdom, and it is kind of a um. There's a certain Carlos Castaneda aspect of this. I don't know if you've ever read any of his books, but uh, they're about this um, anthropology student at UCLA's encounters with a Yaqui Indian shaman from northern Mexico. And they, he takes peyote and he goes on this kind of wisdom quest. I think that's where the, you know, the working title came from. Obviously, Kennedy and Heidi's the name of the episode. They're the teenage girls that are driving that caused Christopher to crash his car. There's been many references to the Kennedys on, you know, in Camelot, of course, being the most, uh, one of the most obvious and prominent. Um, Kelly Moltisante at the funeral, Tony says, look at her, she looks like Jackie Kennedy. Now, Um, let me ask you a question, if I would. I don't want to get into politics. Do you think the Kennedys were good people? Or not good people. There's been so many things written about them. What well, do you? Well, I mean, listen. I mean, uh, uh, good people. I mean, who's a good person? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think they're complicated people. I'm I think, a good guy. I think uh, politically, uh, there were a lot of good things they did. You know what I mean? Whether they were good people or not, I don't know if that matters as much because they were public servants. What they got done. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, Ted Kennedy, you know, you know his story. Well, Ted, I mean, I don't know. I'm talking yeah. more, yeah. Uh, I, Robert, the, Robert Kennedy was Robert. a good guy. They fought for civil rights, John, JFK, you know, as well. A um, lot of corruption with the father, 
you know, uh, Joseph Kennedy, a lot of corruption, a lot of yeah. But I mean, uh, dirty jo- doings I'm talking politics. more about Robert and John. I think they yeah. were. I think they had a lot of good intentions, um, and got some good stuff done. You know, know. Uh, David called me, and I'll get into it as we get to Vegas portion. David called me uh, about this episode, uh, asked me some a lot of Vegas questions, and I'll get into that as oh, we good. Uh, go later on. The, you know, yeah, you know I, what? Uh, that's good. I want to. I want to hear what he had to say, what he had to ask you, and what you told him. Tony Soprano. Besides this accident, which is very you know critical to this show. This episode was in three other accidents in Isabella. He remember he crashes the car when the hitmen are trying to kill him in guy walks into a psychiatrist's office. He passes out from the panic attack and has an accident and in irregular amount uh, around the margins when he's driving on the uh, road with Adriana. Yeah, they have a crash. This is the fourth crash for Tony Soprano. Um, I, You know what? What I really admired about this episode is that. Obviously, the big moment, Tony kills Christopher. They, you know, the, the main character kills another main character. It's kind of a shocking thing that happens, but it happens right at the beginning of the episode, pretty yeah. much, which yeah. is pretty wild, I thought. Yeah, it doesn't happen at the end. Absolutely. The, the show goes on. I noticed that very, very much. Very early on, it happens. Very early on, which is, it makes it, you know, you think that kind of moment comes at the end or something Would like be, that, yeah. but it was great. It was a really great way to tell that story. That is the difference between other shows and The Sopranos. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Now, in this, uh, the garbage dump, the garbage truck dumps asbestos. The manager says, you can't dump it no more. You need to talk to your boss. Uh, this is a huge job. Where am I supposed to dump this? And there's a great scene. There's a kid here, Alexander Flores, played by. When they say there's no small roles, here's a kid, and he, he says, what are you doing, breathing and eating? And the kid says, you know, he told me to take my break. So the kid's eating. There's asbestos flying all over the place. And the kid, you know, says something in Spanish, you know, what's asbestos? What's that? He, he says, what is it? He doesn't know what it is. Do you and, know... Uh, it's the great. look on yeah. his face. Yeah, there's no small roads. Beautiful moment here. Very specific and really uh, nail. You know, in any other show, that would just be a nothing moment. You know what Correct. I mean? And a, and a nothing character. And who that acted? Those two actors really bring a lot to the to that moment. You know what's weird? I never knew this. Asbestos is a natural mineral. Did you know that? Well, they had a, a, a asbestos. Uh, mine out in vegas see i didn't know it was a mine i thought it was some chemical shit it's not yeah you know it's a mined mineral that goes back they found it in the uh uh, pottery from the stone age that was strengthened with asbestos really yeah you know when i clean chimneys i've talked about that when i was in college i was a chimney sweep and when we used to have to pull like the, the the from the boiler to the chimney that thing uh, we used to use asbestos. We had bags of asbestos. And I remember at the time you kind of knew maybe it was no good. You know, they could have used plaster, but here we are walking around with asbestos. And I'm thinking, ah, what the fuck's going to happen 30 years from now? Honestly, I mean, I worked with asbestos a lot. Imagine if you did it for 20 years every yeah. day. You know, 100,000 people die. Out of asbestos related, you know, um, illness and many countries still produce it. Russia, uh, Russia is the number one producer of asbestos. They still, wow. you know, yeah. I mean, now here in the, in the States, I mean, if it's in the schools or whatever, they close shit down in buildings. They'll close the building down. It's a health hazard to everyone. You know, they'll, you know, they don't continue on, you know. No, 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 they have to. It's very dangerous. A parking lot near the Statue of Liberty. Uh, Christopher and, and Tony meet with Phil and Butch. Uh, you know, I, I just uh, now find out it's asbestos you've been dumping there. You know, and, and Tony goes, come on, you know what it was. You got the same skill, uh, same scam, Phil. So why don't you cut through the bullshit? Uh, you know, nobody's been hiding nothing. I had the same dumping deal with the operations manager since uh, Barone Sanitation. Phil says maybe it's 10 packs. He's a sarcastic fuck and he wants 25%. 
Phil just wants to, I think you know, he wants to kind of crush Tony Soprano, basically. Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, Christopher's obviously distracted, jo uh, jonesing. He's, you know, he's not in, he's not in a good head. This was my last scene of The Sopranos. Oh, it was. By the way. That wow. was my last day. And how did last you feel? scene last moment well you know it, it's interesting because everyone always asks what was it like shooting the death scene that it was the death scene was kind of another day at work in a weird well, way well, the death scene film. that day that day on set with the death scene it was really all about the stunt which was kind of mind-boggling that somebody yeah. actually did flip that car um this was my last scene my last day at work um it was you know emotional uh you know it was strange did you go out afterwards i don't remember That's you know why you, then i know you ways, went out i know in, you went out if you maybe don't remember it. in some ways like we we spoke about it it never really sank in until we were in florida and watched that last episode yeah. you know what i mean because there was still stuff to do there was yeah. going to be the premiere there might have been the emmys it might have been this and that or whoever it wasn't whatever. over yet exactly it, it wasn't, wasn't over, over yet um Christopher is wearing a baseball hat in this scene and wears a baseball hat in his last scene, which is interesting because in the pilot, when we first see Christopher, he's driving Tony Soprano. He's wearing a baseball cap. He's wearing a Colorado Rockies cap. Here he's wearing a cleaver cap. But I think there is some kind of full circle thing with the baseball cap. And Michael doesn't wear baseball caps. I'm not a hat guy, period. I'm not a hat. I never was. Christopher's car. Christopher's driving Tony. Frankly, Tony, I'm thinking uh, we should meet his number. Uh, he said, I think that'll set a, ter a terrible precedent. He tell he says he's got him by uh, the guts right now. He's got, he, Phil's got them by the balls. You know, he, he says he's, what, the fly? Flying, oint uh, flying <laughs> ointment instead, instead of the fly in the ointment, fly the flying the ointment. ointment. And Life's Christopher's like, short. let him have it. Life's too short. What happened to stop and smell the roses? Um, Tony kind of says, maybe you're right. You know, he puts on the departed soundtrack. Uh, Comfortably Numb is a Pink Floyd song originally uh, on the Wall album, 1979. Music by David Gilmore, lyrics by Roger Waters. Uh, the lyrics were inspired. It's interesting. Roger, in 1977, Roger Waters had bad stomach cramps before a concert in Philadelphia. A doctor gave him an injection of tranquilizers. In Phil and, and Roger Waters says it was the longest two hours of his life trying to do a show. He could hardly lift his arms. Comfortably Numb is about that experience. This version is not the one from the Pink Floyd album. It's actually Van Morrison singing it. Uh, Rick Danko and Levon Helm of the band uh, playing the music, and this was on the um, the Scorsese Departed Did movie soundtrack. Did you like soundtrack. that movie, Departed? I've never seen it, uh, okay. to be honest with you. I should okay. see it because I like, uh, I obviously like uh, Scorsese. And uh, he says, whatever happened to Stop and Smell the Roses? Um, Tony says, on says, the other hand, life's too short to live as a lackey. Right, but then he says, Tony just looks at him and says, asbestos. And they both laugh. They have this little bonding moment. Each day's a gift, you know? I, I feel that with my kid. Tony says that stuff with Junior. Fuck all this. Christopher talks about the stereo. This system's got no balls. Um, and then the song plays, and there's lyrics that are very kind of, I think, pointed to this scene. Uh, when I was a child, I caught a fleeting glimpse. And in hindsight, I have to say this made me think of the many saints in Newark because when Tony was a child, he caught a fleeting glimpse of this kid. The child, and then the song says, "The child has grown, the dream is gone." Tony sees Christopher as a baby. Uh, I cannot put my finger on it. And Tony glances at Christopher, and it's and he's seeing something. I, I couldn't help but not connect it to the movie. There, obviously, the movie wasn't made back then. Um, but I do think this. I think when Tony looks over at Christopher, I think he knows that he's high. Christopher's not high. Christopher's not. High. You don't think? I think he is. He's jumpy. I think he's coked up. 
He had cocaine in his system. Yeah, he might. He's not high I, on heroin. No, no, not heroin. He might have done a blast I, but he was, or two of coke. But he yeah. Was, yeah, and he was uh, looking at his watch when they were talking to Phil. He's he very distracted. He's distracted. Yeah. And I think Tony kind of sees a little of that because Christopher's a little jumping in the car. He and notices, he, yeah. And he says to him at one point, "What is this make believe ballroom? Kind of, you know, you keep changing it. And then, yeah. you know, hey, hey, fucking drive, relax, you know." So I I I I know there's a moment. Yeah, he might have done some a little coke, right? I agree. You know, uh, it, Phil is just a miserable fuck. They don't get along. He tells you know, uh, you know, when when, told, when he's talking about stop and smell the roses, he said people like Phil they stick the rose up their ass thorns first. Him and that Butch are miserable fucks. Yeah, Phil and Butch. Bad guys. Yeah, bad guys. Heidi's car, uh, you know, so, they, they, you know, they, they he swerves over. Christopher swerves out of the way. Another car is coming. There's the two young girls. Heidi drives, almost crashing into Christopher. Uh, the car, like you said, is one of the most incredible stunts you ever saw. Yeah, and anybody, if you haven't seen our episode with stunt coordinator Pete uh, Bucosi, you should see it because he goes into great detail about this stunt. Yeah. Because it's one of the best stunts I've ever seen on any movie, TV show, anywhere, but certainly the, the, the most dramatic on The Sopranos. It's It was, um, there was a guy in that car that flipped, you know, I mean, they shot at many angles, so they repeated some of the flip, but he did flip it like four times. I mean, Incredible. it was really crazy. And, uh, you know, Heidi, you know, they said, you know, uh, maybe you should go back, Heidi. And I just said, Kennedy, I'm on my learner's permit after dark. Uh, that's a little soprano humor, obviously. That moment, you know, that the two kids would be there and got the learner's permit. I mean, that's sure. somebody else that would have just been a car you would have never saw who was in the car, you know, another show. Well, they flipped the car. The car finally settles. Christopher's really fucked up. Uh, Tony's hurt. Christopher says, I'll never pass a drug test. You know, I bought a house. Uh, in Westchester, up about an hour outside the city in 2007, right right when the show aired. And uh, there was a teenage kid who lived there with his parents before I bought it. And in the garage on the wall, after I moved in, I saw he had written, I'll never pass a drug test. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. I guess he left that message for me. I don't know. Oh, is that what it was? It was being a... Smart Alec? I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, this Alec, then it said, say. we're with the Vipers on the other side. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he's joking around. Somebody, yeah. uh, somebody, this is the uh, scene where Jason, Mr. Jason, Jason Minter, David Chase's assistant, said somebody was selling pictures to the Inquirer over $100,000, oh. and there was oh, right. pictures of Christopher dead in the car. Bad, um, bad, bad. That was uh, before social media, really, or, or most of it. Uh, and it was in the Inquirer newspaper, all right? Uh, Tony gets out of the car. Now, Christopher was at, he wasn't wearing a seatbelt, correct? He was not wearing a seatbelt. Because uh, I thought for a second, maybe Tony took the seatbelt off. No, he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. And Tony looks in and sees... The branch would have probably killed the baby because it's right, you know, through the car seat there. Trees, it, again, you know, the trees we've had symbolic of death, uh, especially in the Isabella episode, uh, the uh, long-term parking episode. Christopher, after Paulie, you know, wrecks Christopher's landscaping in that, at the end of that episode, Christopher puts that tree, tree yeah. and plants that tree. So there's kind of repetitive theme. Death or, you know... Was it cold out when you shot this? Uh, I don't remember. I'll be honest with it you. It looks cold. I love that he says, call me a taxi. <laughs> Christopher looks like, to me, he was going to die either way. Well, uh... I mean, that's what it looks you know. like to me. He looks like he was in bad shape. He was wheezing. Also, I caught a little uh, gaff. He has a, the hat on. And it's sideways, and then he doesn't have the hat on. There was a little split second of that. And I played it over and over, so I saw it. Christopher had the hat on, not had the hat on. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, when uh. he was fucked up there. Uh, I, you know, to me, when Tony actually covers his nose and mouth there, you see the dead. Jim Gandolfini, Jim's eyes are dead. Tony Soprano's eyes are just dead. Cold, clinical, no emotion. Dead. A murder. He's a murderer. Do not forget this. And he didn't think fucking twice about it. He didn't think twice. You know, Junior, Uncle Junior said at one point, Tony brought it up about drug addiction, and Junior said, put yeah. him out of his misery like we used to do yes. in the old days. It, you know, he's think probably thinking about, is he justified, why he's doing this? Christopher dies knowing that Tony kills him, though. There's a moment when Christopher sees him doing it. Oh, yeah. He looks up at him. It's a great moment. Was that in the... Did you do that, or was that in the direction? I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, it's a great scene, a sad scene. Very sad. Uh, really, really sad. I mean, watching it was, and like you said, I kind of remembered it much more, Tony figuring it out. Should I, should I not? Is he going to die? Is he not? He just goes right after him and kills him. Fucking he knows snuffs that that's him what out, he's going to do. He, for a split second, he opens the phone like he's going to call, closes it, boom, no two ways, doesn't care. He's holding it while the car, it's a good fit. The light is on his face as he's holding your nose and mouth. And there's a car passes by. And what do you think? What are the main reasons? Give me the top two reasons. I, I think, uh, listen, Christopher is not getting sober. He's not being fixed here. Right. And like Junior said, he's a detriment. You could flip at any time. That's why. Okay. I think he's still pissed off about the movie. Oh, yeah. That's for sure. But the biggest thing is, if Christopher gets busted, he'll give him up in a second. A junkie will give you up in a second. Yeah. You know, it's hard enough, uh, you know, just in general. You get arrested, you're facing, you know, 50 years in jail or life in prison. You, you give somebody up. But now, you know, you're a junkie. You're not thinking straight. You could get caught with the littlest bullshit, you know. So I think that's the biggest thing. It's self-serving. The reason he kills him. Yeah, For him and oh, him absolutely. alone. It has nothing to do with the other guys or anybody else. It's him and him alone. And I think he also has some petty resentments about Juliana. I think he has some resentments about the movie. And just, uh, you know, well, Christopher started to been, annoy him. I think it's been building up. Yeah, it's absolutely. been building. Yeah, He's got the motive. Christopher Bacala moved up the ladder. Christopher's, you know, got left behind there. He's not around as much. He can't handle his liquor. You know, there was that scene, uh, you know, when Christopher goes off the wagon in front of everyone. Yeah. Hospital, Tony's taken out of the ambulance. He brought to emergency. He gets tested. Uh, he asks how his friend, how is he? Your friend's dead. Do you know a contact number? Uh, and the nurse and the EMT, very cold. I guess they do this every day. They every just, day, yeah. Very cool. Soprano bedroom. The nurse calls Carmela. Who's this? I'm here with your husband. He'd like to speak to you. Sit down. I mean, Tony, instead of just coming right out with a Christmas dead, are you sitting down? Sweetheart, there's been an accident. It's like, come on, tell me already, God damn it. It's a hard thing to say. But Edie, man, that gasp. I mean, oh, she yeah. just plays it like uh, it's real very, as real could be. As real as real could be, my friend. You know? He drove off the road. The car flipped. You okay? I banged my knee. They're gonna they're gonna call Kelly if they haven't already. Get Alan Reed around the phone. You know, Tony's taking care of business. He knows what's about to happen here. Carmela's very upset. Christopher's house. We T see Tony looks at the hat and the T-shirt and the blood all over it, and he looks at it, and there's no emotion at all. None at all. He's, he murdered him. That's it. This is like any other hit at this point but the that cut he's ever done. From that, so Tony looks at the blood, bloody T-shirt, bloody hat. Christopher's dead. There's his blood. Cut two. It's Paul Schaefer yeah. on Late Night with David Letterman kind of laughing in this very weirdly sinister way. And then Kelly screaming. It's almost, there's something almost... From Tony's coldness to that kind of sinister laughter, something very satanic and disturbing yeah. about it, I it's found. Very, very 
tough to look at. She's sincerely just fucking devastated. Soprano bedroom. Now I'm going to bring something up here, and I don't know if you'll agree with me or not. But Silvio, we came as long as we could hear it. So it's Silvio, Bobby, Paulie, and Walden, played by Frank John Hughes. He's only been in a few episodes. Uh, we came as soon as we heard. Last thing we, you know, we remember, you know, Tony, you could kind of tell he's lying, and I think Silvio knows it. Silvio's very smart. If anyone's going to pick up on it, it's Silvio. I think, I think Silvio... Silvio knows it. The way he's looking at him, the way Tony's lying, Silvio's smart and he knows him better than anyone else. Silvio knows that something's not being revealed Correct. here. Uh, an interesting point, at the beginning of this scene, you hear the sound of a crow cawing. If you remember in Fortunate Son, when Christopher's getting made, there's a crow in the window that Christopher sees that really disturbs him, that he says it was a bad omen. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did hear the crow. You know, Bobby skid marks all over the place, Paulie. Paulie always makes it about himself. He had a heavy foot, that kid. Oh, that, 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 that. He had a heavy cut. That kid always, he almost put me through a billboard. So, again, back to him. Back to him, yeah. That's he true. almost put him through a billboard. Not that that guy's dead. Right. You know what I mean? Then he kisses Tony's ass. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, he says, fucking idiot. Tony Soprano says, uh, you know, he didn't have his seatbelt on, his chest filled up, suffocated, uh, blood tests on him, alcohol, drugs. Uh, and, and, and Paulie it kisses fucking Tony's ass here. At least you're okay, Skip, you know. And they, they, the nonsense with Carlos is a rival. The guys are very upset. Christopher was a well-liked guy. Uh, he was well-liked by everyone. You know, what's interesting is during the intervention, Christopher said, I should I should uh, suffocate you. He says here, if he, was he high? No, he wasn't high. I would have strangled him. But in the intervention, he says, I should suffocate you. He says that to Christopher. So you think they knew that Christopher was going to die this way back then? Or because that was said, that's how they killed him? I don't know. Interesting. But, I mean, it is interesting. Are you gathering up your questions for David Chase when he comes on the finale? I should, shouldn't I? I'm going to point blank ask him if Tony's alive or dead. You should. There's no wiggle room here. I'm going to ask him. Give me an answer. You should ask him. I think that's good. But we need to start writing questions now. I, 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 yeah. Well, let's do that. This is a good one. About I'm going to write that down. That's a Mayonnaise, good idea. Mayonnaise, eggs. What would have happened to Livia? Suffocation. Three o'clock. Andy, make sure you write some of these down, please. Keep track of these. Cause we're... Put the fuck a drink down, Andy. I think it's a, what's a funny line is uh, Christopher was dedicated to the program after he threw little Paulie out the window. It's just, I thought that was kind of a funny line. It's very it still funny. Says, Let's not go mean. there. Let's not go there. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, Walden says, I, I think that's Carlo pulling up. And then they say something else about Carlo. And, uh, and then Silvio says, Why, who cares about Carlos' arrival? Uh, very funny. Uh, soprano house, the kitchen, you know. When there's death, there's food in an Italian uh, house. That's right. That's right. You know, they sent out for bagels, it looks like. They want to uh, make a plate. All the guys are downstairs. Bobby's eating a bagel. Food, food, food. Always food. But Tony uh, doesn't want food. He wants a scotch. He wants a scotch. He tells uh, Meadow, you should have one too. You know, the cousins were close. They're not cousins. Christopher and, and Meadow are not cousins. Well, I don't know about not that. Not blood cousins. Because uh, Christopher and Carmela were cousins. Blood cousins? I think so. I don't think so. But... You know how oh, they goes. were close. Everybody's an uncle. Yes, they were very close. Uh, Bobby, uh, he comes down. Bobby clears out. They're at the counter. Here comes uh, Tony. A scotch and get yourself one. Paulie says, I know I have my differences. This is where he says, if you were his dad, I was his Dutch uncle. What the fuck do I know? You know, he's, you know. Maybe I didn't do right money. by him, he says. Maybe I didn't do right by the kid. We were fighting over bullshit money. Breaking his balls when he tried not to drink. And Tony just says it's over. 
I think he's feeling guilty, feeling very guilty, Paulie, because they did. And it's like a lot of times, uh, you know, you say things that you really mean Regret. fucking nothing. And then you go, what the fuck was the big deal? Like why did I end, care yeah. why about Why did I that? worry about all this shit at the what end of the, the day? What the fuck, yes. you know? I mean, why? So was it really that important? Christopher Silas Tony sits at the table with uh, uh, Kelly's mom and dad, Christopher's mom, Janice, Meadow, Carmella, Bobby are there. Rita gives the news they found cocaine in his blood. I don't think they find that out so soon, but they said he, he may have made it, uh, but he didn't. Al, the father-in-law, is very upset, calls him a wackadoo. He's left his granddaughter fatherless. Joanne is drinking heavily. She's inconsolable. Very, a lot of drama. Uh, then uh, Patsy comes in with the news. Uh, Paulie's mother died. Nucci, stroke. She, they went to see the Jersey Boys concert. She died on the bus. She died on the bus after seeing Jersey Boys. Another Frankie Valley reference. Uh, Plenty of them on the show. Al's pissed off. The airbags crushed your ribs, Meadow says, if you're not wearing a seatbelt. Bobby's watching a basketball game eating. He doesn't look like he's mourning that much. He's eating. Well, you know, listen, you go in and out when you're mourning. Uh, It's not, you know. Chris's mom drinking, hysterical crying. And And she wasn't a very good mother to him growing up. We know that, right? She was an alcoholic, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Melfi's office. Tony says, it's difficult. This is pain I'm not used to. Uh, It's like a son. I see him die like that practically in my arms, and then he says, it's bullshit. I'm fucking relieved. It's a drag drag on my emotions. Uh, You know. He's complaining. Every morning I wake up thinking, it's today the day that one of my best friends is going to die me on the FBI. It's about him. And a weak, fucking sniveling, lying drug addict, which is why he killed him. Uh, That's the worst kind. Uh, Let let me tell you something. I've murdered friends before, even relatives. My cousin Tony, my best friend Puss. But this, uh, Tony completely heartless. Melfi's surprised. Sees how ruthless Tony is. And we find out in the next scene it's a dream. I didn't know it was a dream when I first saw it. Well, when he says I've murdered friends and relatives. Hey, or, maybe he's going, you know, she can't tell. Can't she tell? I think you can. You think you can? Yeah. He would never tell her that shit. No. Uh, uh, soprano bedroom. Oh. Tony wakes up from the dream. Was I talking in my sleep? Carmella can't sleep. Dick Cavett, who I've worked with. You know Dick Cavett? I do know Dick. We met him. Uh, he came to one of the plays at Studio Dante. He just showed up somehow. One of the Flat plays. Flat out I- legend. That's a legend. And then he wanted to come to the acting class. So one night, he came to the acting class that I was teaching with uh, Vince Curtola, Sharon Angela, and Nick Sandow. He was a guest teacher. And he did a trip. You know, the night of the play, Jim was there. I, I forget which play it was, but Gandolfini was in the audience, as was Cavett. So after the play, you know, we were hanging out, having a few drinks in the theater. Dick Cavett did a trick. Dick Cavett was, is a small guy, right? Yeah, he's not. Small guy. So small he, guy. he stood still and he said to Jim, okay, pick me up. And Jim was a big, strong guy. He, pick, he kind of picked him up like this, grabbed him, you know, like a bear hug and lift him off his feet. And then he goes, okay. And Dick went, he, he took like a deep breath, concentrated. He goes, now pick me up again. And Jim couldn't do it. Really? It was one of the weirdest things I ever saw. I was like, he goes, well, I studied Aikido. I don't know what the fuck he did. Really? Jim couldn't. Jim could not pick him up the second time. Wow! Wow! And then Dick, uh, the first concert my band played in New York, uh, Dick introduced us at Don Hills. I was there. I was there that night. You he know, was a, uh, he's a be- the best talk show host in history. The, the episodes, especially with the musicians, with John and Yoko and Jimi Hendrix. I mean, just well, fantastic. he got all those guys. He was on at the you know when Carson was on, right? Uh, but he was uh, no, he was a hip guy. He was on ABC, and you know, really, really he smart. was a hip guy. He comes from the same place as Johnny Carson. 
right? Where was it? Oklahoma? Uh, Nebraska. Nebraska. Omaha, and I think. I did a movie with him called Dwayne Hopwood. And uh, we had a reading in Tribeca, and I was getting off the train. He was getting off the train, and I bumped into him. He introduced himself. We walked in together. He had a small role with uh, David Schwimmer. And I got to know him, and I've run into him numerous times, and he's a delightful guy. The best. I love Flat him. Flat out delightful yeah. guy. Uh, and if you want, he had Marlon Brando on. He they had from, he was another guy from Omaha, Nebraska. Brando was from Nebraska. And, and uh, he had Norman Mailer. He had all these different kind of guests that would go on Johnny Carson. It was a whole different vibe. Well, know? it was much better than Johnny Carson because they'd actually have a conversation. It wasn't just like plugging something and trying to get a laugh and trying to kind of you know, entertain. They'd actually talk. They'd get into deep discussions about politics, about life, about, you know, you know, that's that's why it was a good show. Yeah. You know, a lot of these late night shows, it's just you do a pre-interview. They're going to bring up a story that you're going to tell. You're going to tell a little anecdote. There's not really conversation. Well, it's almost not it's like a, this, like you and I having no, a real no. moment. You know, it's, it's almost always like that. Yeah, they're going to ask canned. you this or they're going to ask you this and then you're going to tell this story. And you've gone over the story, and they very rarely stray. And what they do sometimes, the late night talk show, they have a, based on your answer, they have a joke ready. Yeah. Understand? So if I go, uh, like, you know, like I, I remember when I did Leno for the first time. So it was, so Steve, uh, in Vegas, what was your first job? I said, well, I delivered pizzas. And he says, what does he say? It's amazing anyone ever got to them. Any, is there any, any of them got delivered? You should have punched him in the face when he yeah. said that. But that was, you know, that was the joke. You should so have the just joke hauled, was on hauled me. off and just punched him right in the face. So that's what they did. So it's never a conversation because it's not real. So it's like a setup. Right. You're going to ask me this, I'm going to say that. Right, it's a little nerve-wracking, you know. You know. It's bullshit is what it is. But yeah. his show was a real conversation, and that's why it was great. What's interesting here is Catherine Hepburn being interviewed by Dick Cavett, she says... I laugh, I cry, I act, I always get the part. I'm red in the face, all of which is Tony. Tony's red on the face from the uh, uh, airbag burns. He's laughing, he's crying, he's acting, he's pretending. It's an interesting little chore. Why'd they choose that? For that reason, maybe. Now, she was with Spencer Tracy for years, or wasn't she? They, well, they did a lot of movies together. I think they had kind of a, I think he was married, uh, and there was an affair. Uh, but, you know, Spencer Tracy was a, uh, Really bad alcoholic. I don't know really? if you knew that. Oh, uh, no. Oh, oh, I'm talking One of legendary. my favorite actors. Do you know that? I think the he's a genius. St. George Hotel in Brooklyn Heights. He would check in and bring ton luggage full of liquor, tons of liquor, and just stay in the bathtub, barely eat and just drink. I'm talking a week or two. She would come and stay with him, and, and kind of nurse him back to health. And then he would clean up and then go out and work, and da, 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 and then X amount of time later, the same thing. It's legendary. You could read a ton of stuff here. That, that's, that, that was it. Uh, uh, honestly, Spencer uh, Tracy oof, was horrible. Uh, horrible, but like you say, a terrific actor. One of the best ever. Uh, Soprano Kitchen, Tony goes to get coffee, a cleaver mug. He walks outside and he throws it in the woods. Ever since the movie, they started talking about the movie, we've seen cleaver hats, cleaver right. mugs, you know, all kinds of cleaver stuff. Tony had enough of cleaver. That's where you say he really irritated him what Christopher did in that movie, portraying how he portrayed Tony Soprano. Absolutely. He hated the portrayal. He also hated the whole distraction of the thing. And uh, Christopher's yeah. head was in that. And rather than in the day to day business and the shit with little Paul, and it went happened. nowhere. Cleaver went nowhere. Another oh, I don't know about film. that. I think it had a cult following. Oh, really? I don't know. I don't oh, think they yeah. made money. You think they made money from it? They certainly did. Yes. You saw that? That's just in your head. I, I would think it made a lot of money. I saw no proof anywhere. That ever happening. Uh, you know, I don't always need proof, Steve. <laughs> well, apparently, from the bullshit that you say on this podcast, 
There's no proof in any of that stuff. That's right. I think it probably it eventually made a lot of money. You think uh, you have no proof of people coming back as animals? What? People you have, don't come back as animals. I mean, they, you told they, me that. Yeah, but it's not like people come back. It's mindstream that comes back. It's not like a person Willie, that comes back. I told back. you, Willie, I think, is my mother-in-law. I told he you. He might have been, sure. He farts like my mother-in-law. He eats no. like my mother-in-law. He's nosy like my mother-in-law. You know what I mean? He's nosy? He's very nosy. Is he jealous? Oh, sure. Are you kidding me? If I go and hug my wife, he goes crazy. Wow. Or the kids. My daughter's come off. He goes crazy. He's very jealous. Wow. Very jealous. My mother-in-law wasn't jealous. She was a good woman. Um, soprano, <laughs> soprano Kitchen, Tony talks to Carmela. I think my to myself, how could I ever uh, have said those things about him? Uh, he, Carmela says he would have never. Because remember, she, she thought that maybe he did something. He was handy. Hey, Adriana, maybe sure. he was responsible for her missing now she's saying there's no way. He loved her. You know, he never, you know, I have guilt about what I said about Adriana. He never would let himself take her life. Why are we always so quick to blame? Tony's just cold as ice here. You know, no, you know, there's no guilt. You know, and then he asks her, it's so weird. He asks her, are you, are you relieved? And she's like, what? Yeah. yeah. What the, f what are you talking about? Because that's how he's feeling, obviously. Carmelo says it's hard not to think of Chris as a child, and I get that. Ah, uh, and then Tony gives a you know a bad joke, especially when his daughter Kathy looks like him. And it won't do her any good come puberty. Uh, a funny line: Can you make me coffee? That machine uh, from Paulie? You need a pilot's license. Yeah, some of those machines are like that. Uh, everything is insane. If I didn't have my wife, I couldn't make it through the day. I was in a hotel and they had a fancy, uh, the, in the room, there was a fancy coffee maker. Uh, it took me an hour and a half to figure out how to make coffee. Yeah. It's crazy. It was horrible. I couldn't find the power button. I know. It's crazy. Even on some of the lights. How about like, you know, like in Vegas when you stay in the places where they have the remote, the curtain and that curtain and this curtain. It oh, drives you crazy. Yeah, I know. Especially if you come in a little fucked up, you're drunk. Late at night, yeah, you're trying oh, to figure shit. out how to put the lights on. Yeah, I know. It's trying to, you, you wind up fucking falling asleep with your clothes on. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Carmela says a lot of women find Christopher attractive. Uh, well, you know, yeah, Christopher had a lot of good looking women. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. He's, uh, you know, and then Tony gives her the about the car seat. That the baby would have been mangled beyond recognition. She says, I did feel guilt. I, I was relieved when I found out that it was him, not you. And she yeah. feels guilty about that. She said, Chris held me when you were shot. Uh, she says, the tree band, uh, Caitlin would have been dead. And she just walks away. She's kind of like, kind of really not down with what he's saying and kind of shocked at his insensitivity here and his coldness. She senses well, it. You know... Uh, you know, to be honest, you know, Christopher, I mean, of course, he's a murderer, so everything is relative here. They're all murderers, every one of them. But Christopher, I don't think he was a bad guy. He was a neighbor guy with a big problem. He was a junkie, made him do some crazy shit. But, you know, once he got promoted and started moving up the ranks, you know. He it, tried. It, he tried to do the right thing, but it was know, a day late and a dollar short. They're know? all murderers. I mean, they're, they're flat out, you know, murders. What are, what's that? Psychopaths? Sociopaths? I mean, they're, Sociopaths, they're yeah. They're murders. Yeah. Sociopaths. Uh, see, Tony tells Murphy, I told her about the baby seat so she wouldn't feel so rotten. I don't know how that works. I mean, he was high as a fucking guy. I didn't tell her that. I'm the asshole again. There's been some hard moments. Lying drug addict, fantasize about my down, downfall. We even show people in his filthy thoughts on a movie screen. Let me tell I you I mean, something. it's so weird. I mean, he talks about his cousin, Tony B. They shot his face away. I had carried this kid through the worst of his grief, a huge problem of his own making. I handled it. I felt sorry for him. He talked gratitude, but, sh you know, shit on, you know, shit on the pity, uh, 
he's talking to his therapist <laughs> about his nephew or whatever he calls him who he killed so he's in i don't what is he trying to do in therapy is what i get what i don't get what what the fuck is he doing here he wants to get it off his he, there's no one else he could tell in the world but he's not telling her he's not telling you can't tell if you tell him. i know that so what is he trying to do he's basically trying he to say to, my my nephew he, was a fuck up and it's kind of okay that he's dead i want to yeah I, I, he, i'm not i'm relieved that he's dead it's okay that he died uh, she he's doing everything but telling her that he killed her killed him uh, i i took up the slack he cried i couldn't deal with it uh, you know how you're handling this and he, she and he complains to her i gotta go to the funeral i gotta sit there with people who are hurting bad that makes me feel like a hypocrite back to him it makes him feel bad he's a hypocrite. Him feel he like killed the guy it. yeah <laughs> and, and, and that's what makes uh, me mad at them so he's gonna get mad at them because he feels like a hypocrite because he murdered this kid this scene to me really shows what this final season is about. Tony Soprano has become evil. He's I dead. Did, they, There's they something just it. fucking dead. There's something dead in him here. You know, he killed this guy in cold blood, his nephew, whatever, his relative. There's something that has died inside this guy and what's left is, is evil. I really see that here. Yeah. Satanic almost, really. Tony tells Melfi, uh, you know, Chris's mother abandoned him as a kid, but now getting sympathy and tears. She's crying and everyone, you know, she was a shitty mother, but now, you know, she's getting the sympathy. He doesn't like that. Yeah, Listen, her son's dead. Like it or not. Fuck up or I, not. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. As I get older, I find funerals wakes to be just flat out barbaric for the people that have to go. It's barbaric to me. What about that, a memorial? I don't mind the memorial, celebration of life, but to go to a funeral, and I just went to a few recently of close friends, laying there in a casket, you know, on display, like some kind of fucking, I don't know what, and people are at the wake and they're laughing. And they're joking like a cocktail party. Not everyone's mourning. And they go up and they go online. It's an obligation. They don't want to be there. Yeah. But they got to go show their face. They don't want to go. And yeah, it's pretty horrible. to me. And it's very hypocritical. And this open casket thing. And I, and I got to be honest. I mean, uh, you know, and then there's all good things. You know, then, then they say, he looks good. Just like Carmelo says here. Oh, he looks great. Doesn't he look great? They did a beautiful job on it. Beautiful him. job. He looks horrible. I remember when we shot that scene. You looked horrible. You got the fucking lipstick shit on your lips. It's scary, horrible. No one ever looks good in the casket, ever. Fucking no. stop this ritual. Stop it. You want to celebrate this man, woman's life? Do that. I find it very weird. Yeah, I find it very Have strange. a fucking party. Laugh. Remember the good times. You know, remember the, the, the time you spent. No but fucking But you don't want way. that. You don't want to remember the good times. You're going to talk about everybody who Yeah, but I'm miserable. not going to be in a casket. I'm not going to be in a casket. You ain't never going to see me. I'm gone. Just on the video, we'll see you. You'll see on the video. But I'm gone. I got some scores to settle, but that has nothing to do with me laying in a casket in a That's big true. fucking fucking casket. I'll probably be spilling out, won't fit in the casket, and you guys will be there. Oh, yeah, this fucking Steve. He was a pain in the ass, but we got to be nice. Look at this fucking guy. He annoyed the shit out of us. You know, I like when they go, Steve sure up. He lit up every room he was in. What a guy. He lit up every room. No. Some people are pricks. And they Some died people are pricks. and they were mean spirited. Stop with this fucking wake shit already. Uh, the, Carmelo, Tony, and, and people like it. Like we see one of the greatest nicknames in TV history, three to five and seven. But and wasn't nine. she two to five, seven and nine yeah. in the early episode? Yeah. Why they change her name? I don't know. I why. don't know. But it's still two to five, seven and nine. And what do they do? 
You're going to eat now, you're going to eat before. No, we'll eat in between. If you'll see any funeral parlor, there's always bars and restaurants very close to them. That do really well. Yeah. That do very well. The wake, they eat in between the family, you know, all that kind of. I remember my grandfather passing away. I was young. I was 11 years old. It was three days and then the church. Three days in the funeral. Three days in the funeral home. That's crazy. You know, uh, the the two to five, seven to nine, eating in between after. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Yeah. They see Juliana Skiff. Uh, She's great in that little moment. You know, such a good actress. Even in that little moment, there's so much unsaid, and it's just great. The three of them, Edie, Jim, and Juliana Margulies. Uh, I don't know. I just love the moment. He, uh, uh, Carmela's a little suspicious. Of course, of course. She's not she sure said, who he was, good uh, who woman, she was. Good-looking woman. You know, she probably assumes any woman that uh, Tony knows, he's fucked her or tried to fuck her. Or you she's know? thinking it was Christopher's gu- Gumad. I don't know. what. Uh, she's great. She almost laughs at one point, you know, and he says, how are you? She almost laughs. It's weird. It's, a, it's an uncomfortable moment. It's very good. Very specific. She tells uh, she tells Carmela, I'm a recovering addict. I owe him a lot. And Carmela, they sit down. She says, I'm going to go up. He says, I'll go up later. Uh, you know, uh, and then Carmela says, he loved you so much. And, and Tony says, really? And, you know, well, you know he did. Daniel Baldwin's there, which was a great little detail having him yeah. there. And the director of Cleaver. Morgan Yam. Yeah, that was pretty cool to have them. Uh, Those two guys are there. Uh, the, the two to five, three to five, whatever. The two to five, seven to nine. Never misses a wake. I told you. There was a girl, Pat, in my neighborhood. She went to everyone's funeral. And you know, people don't know where they come from if you have a family. It could be a friend of this one, that one, this person. So you don't know who comes into the funeral. Sure, party. sure, sure. You know, you know Anybody I mean? could come in. And then, you know, of course, Christopher's mother is screaming. And, you know, I've seen that. They try, you see, he goes, oh, James Brown now, like James Brown used to. You could see it on YouTube when James Brown, when he would say goodnight to the audience and guy comes out with the cape and he falls down and he's crying. And you've seen that. It's incredible, James Brown. But yeah, that's what no, he meant by that. And, uh, you know, I've seen that, you know, where I'm at a funeral and there's stop, lower the air conditioner. She's freezing. He's right. When my father died, there was screaming. Hey, lower the air conditioner. You know, just like insanity. Like insanity on top of the grief. It's fucking insanity. People get, yeah, people get crazy. Their emotions run wild. Uh, we had uh, Marianne Leone, uh, who uh, who came on. Uh, Marianne Leone, who played Joanne. She came on the podcast, spoke about this scene, you know, because it wasn't long after her own son, Jesse, passed yeah. away. And this was a this was a uh, a rough one for her, and she was a trooper and went for it. Um, now, what did it did feel a great like? Job. Feel like sitting in that coffin for hours and it's hours. It's horrible. Being in a coffin's kind of creepy. It was the second time I was in a coffin. I, I the first time I was in a movie called um, Basketball Diaries with Leonardo DiCaprio. My character died of cancer in that one. Uh, not a fun feeling. Did you have a choice? Did they ask you? Do you want to be in it or a closed coffin? Oh, I'm not. I'm not that. I think they closed the casket in that one. No, I mean in, in, in the Soprano one. No, I mean I don't. I don't mind doing it. I'm not afraid to do it. I'm not superstitious that way. Look, I went in. I'm not dead. That was a long time ago. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's not really you. I'm talking to. And now Maybe you're getting it, like now you're getting it, like me. Maybe it's fake, Christopher. <laughs> right, like Paul McCartney. Remember that? You know, who, who seems to have gone off the rails? What's what's his fucking beef with the Rolling Stones? He's uh, he's seventy nine. Paul McCartney now he was beefing with Yoko. Now he's beefing about the Rolling Stones. He called them what a blues cover band. What's yeah. happening here? What's happening? That's, that's a low blow because there's to certainly Sir fucking not Paul. Sir fucking Paul. It's certainly not a blues cover band. Yeah. I don't know. Who knows what goes on? You think at they that have a level. private beef? Yeah. I guess they have a private beef. Yeah. But uh, Mick didn't 
Mick was kind of uh, didn't go there, you know. He took the high road. He took the high road. Like me, I take the high road. Most Always, of the time. that's right. Yeah. I know. Uh, I think that's what Sharifa means in Italian. High road, doesn't high it? High road. Take the yeah. high road. Uh, Kelly's wearing big black dark sunglasses. Tony says Jackie Kennedy, another Kennedy reference. Uh, she's crying when she gets close to Christopher. I remember uh, she was so good, Carabono. I remember that day. Really good, yes. I really re remember that day like it was yesterday. Me too. Uh, Bo Jason's talked to AJ. They're trying to prop him up. Don't let the slinger in your head. They're trying to give him a little pep talk, the two of them. Uh, though I don't like either one of them. They're good actors, both these guys. And they make because they're nice guys. And they're little punks, as we see later on. They're little punks, yeah, obviously. And, and in other episodes, you know. But they're good actors. Both of them are really good actors. Tony uh, looks over at Kelly at one point with a kind of a cold look. It's, you know, he's gone. Something has gone dead in this guy. He's like a shark. He's not, you know, all that evil has now turned him. You know, you can't, you can't do evil without, be, you know what I mean? It's, it's who you are. It's not, yeah. you can't just compartmentalize it. I did this because of this. I did this because of that. At some point, that's it. And They're I all think in. if you talk to, I've read stuff. The, the you know the more you kill the easier it gets the easier it gets where yes. they flat yes. out separate you yes know. you separate and it becomes without a thought he's bringing up the tree limb to little uh, little carmine and the director you know they're kind of not they don't really he he's saying this more for himself obviously yeah for sure he's trying to convince himself he did the right thing for the right reason tony comes in when he first comes into the funeral parlor he gives a boost. There's an old man sitting there collecting the envelope. What do you think he gave? Five hundred dollars. I think that's what he gave. Yeah, five hundred. Uh, you know, they give the uh, boost like they do at a wedding. Uh, the wedding helps the new couple get their life off the ground in theory. And here you're dying, and you give a boost to, to help for the funeral costs in the future, since well, Christopher will no longer be making money. Well, in Chris, in the narration of Many Saints in Newark, Christopher says, "When when I died, Tony gave my wife and daughter his pocket change." There you go. Good looking woman. Tony's, you know, he's faking the grief. Uh, and then Tony sits down in the middle. Carmela comes over. We really should make an appearance at the other wake, which is Nucci, Paulie's mother. Paulie uh, is pissed off. Pissed off. He bought 500 wake cards, prayer cards. No one showed up, or very few. It's a, it's a really dim, small crowd. Sorry for your loss. Not much of a send-off here. She says the room is beautiful. Nobody's in it. What kind of testament is this to the spirit and generosity of the woman? She says it's a lack of respect. I'll never forget it. Uh, he's talking really about Silvio and Carlo. They're not there. Uh, and Tony just says, I got to get out of here. Tony gives another a boost. Gives another one there. Uh, to, uh, Paulie's very grateful that Tony and Carmella showed up. That would have killed him if they didn't show up. Uh, but he's really pissed off. Uh, Dr. Vogel's office, AJ's psychiatrist. Uh, it's really sad, but it's kind of the same with Blanca. I mean, I don't really just keep thinking about things the way I did over and over, you know? And that when, might be the medication the doctor's saying. Medications are working. Uh, are you sleeping? He says, why in class? AJ says, uh, uh, you know, a few college classes he's taken. He seems to be doing better and better spirits hanging around with these Jasons. Yeah. Uh, and thinking, you know, a breakup, you, you think and you ruminate and it, it hurts your head. And you think over and over and over. When it's a bad, you're physically tired from thinking so much. Is that that yeah. ever happened to you? Not just a breakup, but a lot of things. Oh, yeah, sure. Right? You just Absolutely. Keep on being anxiety. It's death. anxiety and worry and all that stuff. The medication, I guess, is helping him. He's going back to college. He's making some friends. He's coming out of his depression. Uh, at the college, they're talking about uh, different medications. Well, Butrin, Lexapro, Andrea, and Jason... 
The kid Victor, who they put the acid on the toes, turns out they had to amputate his toes. Terrible. These kids. These kids are two fucking asshole punks. Yeah, bad and guys. If they're, and if their fathers, they're the murderers of the future. And if their fathers weren't who they were, there'd be nobody. Punks. There'd be nobody, yeah. Fucking punks. Soprano house, Tony looks at Carmella. He's upstairs. He looks down in the living room. Carmella, Rita, Kelly, Joanne in the room downstairs. And Tony has had enough. He does not want to go near. He don't want to hear this shit. He calls. He sees a, but she's breastfeeding. Uh, now, you're against that, right? Breastfeeding? No. Didn't you say both, you're both, against it? No, both of My wife breastfed both of my kids. I, think I thought it's you were against good. it. <laughs> well, I'm against if somebody wants me to breastfeed them. But, uh, no, I'm but not what a, about in public? Oh, I don't care. You're not going to get me on that. <laughs> You made that up because I've never said that. I don't. I have it in my notes. What do you I mean? I could care less. I got it right here. I, I heard could Steve care, is against it. I could care breastfeeding on the train outside. I could care less. Mazel tough. And also, it's very good for the kids growing up. A lot less. Uh, our kids, less, a lot less colds and illnesses growing up. I think breastfeeding is important. If that's what okay, you want. well, I got. Well, I guess my uh, my information you're was in wrong. For whoever gave that to you, your intel is all wrong. All right, I gotta I gotta figure this out where this is coming from. <laughs> so he calls Alan Kaplan, Alan Kaplan, uh, played by Mark Lamora, uh, who passed away in 2017, uh, unfortunately, died died uh, way too soon. He's the host at Caesar's Palace. He says, "I can even get you a plane." Tell your tell. Uh, the audience what a host does because okay, not everybody so, uh, knows a casino host is in marketing you know and what a casino host does you're you're a player a high roller you know depending on where you go you know i mean obviously a place like seasons or the bellagio or the wind you know to get really special treatment you have to gamble more because these are some of the biggest gamblers in the world play in at the these world. clubs right internationally and it's also I mean, if you go to a smaller casino, you know, like the Tropicana or, or somewhere like that, you know, or an older casino, downtown casino, you'll get more bang for your buck. You'll be one of their high rollers for a lot less money, right? So it doesn't go by whether you win or lose, really. It's how much you play. So if I play $200 a hand. They know how much you play. Yeah, they, they're rating you, you know. So I pay two hundred a hand. You buy uh, uh, fifty grand in chips. They know that. They, they, they know that two hundred a hand for eight hours, for ten hours, for five days. That's a lot of theoretical. And if you play long enough, you can lose. Now, if I go in and I lose a half a million dollars playing blackjack at one sitting in an hour, that's another thing. Now, I called Rich Wilk, our friend, and. Uh, our good buddy, he uh, extraordinaire. He's at been TV. a friend of ours for a long time. Rich was the host at uh, at the Hard Rock when I was doing Stewie, and I was and, staying there for the whole time. And, and Rich Mandalay and I, Bay, we've I been spent a lot of time with Rich. Time. Yes. He's a beautiful guy, nice family. All right, so I uh, I asked him, I texted him today. I said, so tell me what for them to send the plane to New Jersey, right? Just for one guy. For one guy. Considering, Rich says, considering it costs 45000 each way from New Jersey to Vegas. 45000 each way for that plane. For, for that plane. Right? So the player, uh, the Circa, Rich Wilk, go see him. Tell him Stephen Michael sent you the Circa. It's the newest casino downtown. It's a beautiful place. Uh, considering it costs 45000 each way from New Jersey to Las Vegas, the player would have to be at least seven hundred and fifty thousand to a million dollar player and up, with history of playing that much and being able to lose that much. Some casinos may own their own jet and have a history of a player losing a half a million a trip, so they may send one for that level of a player as well. So. We've been on Caesar's plane. Remember, they they took us from Chicago to Tahoe. Tahoe, yeah. And then Tahoe back to New York. And 
because we would do uh, working, doing some work for them. But that's the kind of play. So we know Tony has been a gambler. So this was a while ago. Maybe it's a little less, but that's a couple what it's of hundred cost. grand he was playing a uh, regular basis when he goes to Caesars. So he's a now, big player. Now, do they give any? They know he's a wise guy. Is there some of that? Well, I got to tell you, that probably works in reverse these days. These because days, you, yeah. you have to justify it's corporate. I would say in the old days, yes, but now gaming control or Caesar's corporate go, wait a minute, who's this fucking guy? He's not that big a player. You sent the plane for him, and right. him being a wise guy may get them all in trouble. Yeah, it may not look so good. He's People the, see him the at Jersey, the hotel. The, the, the New Jersey boss. So it works in reverse, you know, I would say. And I'd say in the 60s and the 70s, yes. Maybe the 80s. Nowadays. Not anymore. You got to justify why you sent the plane for $90,000, you know. Uh, unless it was filled with six guys. Six and, players or something, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tony flies on a private plane by himself, Right. Uh, David had called me, David Chase called me and asked me all these questions about a host. Uh, you know, would this happen? You know, how much would he have to play? Uh, would he have a suite? All these Vegas questions. And I, I think I was helpful, uh, to him. He asked me, you know, uh, stuff about what we're seeing coming up with the acid, which I don't know much about, but he did ask me about the gambling and the roulette and some stuff. Basic Vegas questions, but we spoke for about 45 minutes, and I gave him some info, which I hope was useful. Uh, Tony drives through that tunnel, which they built that in the 80s. When I first moved there, that wasn't there. That got you from one side of town to the other. So, you know, you know the, the, the airport has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. It used to be a tiny airport when I moved there in 1979. Now that tunnel takes you right very close to the strip. You know, it takes you, with no traffic, it's, you know, 10 minutes to the strip. They want to get the players to the tables as soon as possible. Make it as convenient as you can. Uh, that's the tunnel underneath. Uh, see where he's playing roulette. He loses twice. He gets up. Now, that's Laura uh, Mills McClatchy, who was a dear, our dear uh, friend. Our dear friend. Our friend, and she worked PR for HBO. So I think she worked PR in the travel department. Travel or, or talent relations, maybe? Talent relations. She was yeah. great. Such a great person. Good person. person. Yeah, good friend. She's been an actor. I think she had moved away. She's no longer at HBO. And what was the other? There was a couple of other ones that were great in the talent relations era. So Marav, many people. Marav, Marav was yeah. such a nice, so nice. I think it's all changing of the guard there. But uh, Laura Millis had left a while ago, and, and I really like her a lot. And she... Finally got a shot. She had been an actress. She finally gave her a shot here, which I was happy to see. Tony eats by himself in the restaurant. It looks like he's enjoying the wine. Is that the Palm? What's at Caesars? Is there a steakhouse specifically or no? Well, the steakhouse is in the forum shops, you know. He's uh, having Bordeaux. It looks like a bottle of Bordeaux. That's uh, Do you he's like drinking. eating alone? Do you mind yeah. eating alone? Not at all. I, I, you know, I travel a lot for work and I, I eat out a lot and I have no problem eating alone. I'd rather eat alone than with someone I don't want to be with. I'd rather sense. eat alone than somebody I don't know well. And it's kind of a four, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, uh, I'm totally fine eating by myself. Yeah, me too. Me too. What I do, you know, when I'm on location, I find one place I like and I'll go there a lot. That's what I'll, I'll do that on vacation too. We just did that in Italy. Find a place you like, go there a lot, tip. They get to know you. They know what you like. You, you, you know, it's, that's my favorite thing. Well, to you do. kind of establish yourself there. You yeah. got good service because there's so many places, obviously, and expensive places. And you go, well, let's try somewhere different. Then you go and go, why the fuck did I just spend $300 on dinner? A hundred percent. If you find someplace good, go back. Now, when we were just in Mesa, and uh, of course, from the hotel, they had, you know, it was just a regular dumpy sports, sports bar. bar. But I went there Friday night. I met a, a good friend. Uh, I went there Friday night. I had something to eat, a good friend. And then I went there the next afternoon for lunch. And it was. Well, there wasn't many fine. choices, though. No, but still, perfectly fine. 
The food was good. I had a grilled cheese there, and French fries. I had grilled cheese, so French fries, and I had a hamburger the night before. Was not so, bad, you know. Not bad. It is what it is, but uh, it I is don't what mind it is. eating. I don't mind eating alone either. Uh, restaurant, like I said, Tony joined himself. Uh, literature check class. AJ sits in the class, and the professor is giving a lecture about the material world. Which is kind of a running theme on The Sopranos. Well, it's also right after a scene where here you have this guy enjoying exactly that, the material world. Fancy hotel, private plane, gambling, Bordeaux wine. You know what I mean? It's his father who's enjoying this at the expense of a lot of people's suffering and death and oh, sure. misery. You know, I uh, personally, you know, like when you, you know, you could get a casino raid if you know someone, right? So you call and you say, Whatever. You know somebody, you get a casino rate, a corporate rate. So if the hotel room is $400, you might get it for 300 I'd rather do that than be obligated to gamble. You know, I'm not a big gambler anyway. But if you take sure. the comp and the RFB, which is room, food, and beverage, you're taking that comp. Now you got to play X amount. So your vacation is, shit, I got to play four more hours. I got to play a few more hours. If not, I'm going to have to pay for this stuff. I'd rather just give me a casino rate if I'm going to gamble, and I'll pay my own way. I'll pay for my money. And you don't have to gamble. And you don't have to gamble, you know? Right. Uh, that's what I prefer to do. Uh, Caesar's Powell's pool. He's sitting by the pool. He's relaxing. Now, I we hung out there, remember? At the Caesar's pool? Palace. Was that at the pool at Caesar's when I was wearing all the black? Was that Caesar's? No. Where was no, that? That was at the Hilton. Oh, the Hilton. Okay. Now it's the Westgate, but you were wearing a black suit, black shoes, black shirt. It was 110 fucking degrees. You had sunglasses and you were reading the newspaper or the racing form. The racing form, yeah. And it was like one o'clock in the afternoon, heating up in the dead summer. Summer. Uh, Tony, uh, driver, Tony's, uh, the driver drives Tony to the hotel. To Sonia's apartment, right? Uh, Sonia's apartment. Um, and it's near the Tropicana. I used to live right near there, the Tropicana. I lived around the corner. There used to be the Tropicana Country Club. You oh, know, really? Uh, around there, you know. Uh, see, MGM, where the MGM is, but there used to be a small hotel called the Marina. It was a hotel and casino called the Marina. Part of the MGM is still the marina. They built, like, kept that structure. Uh -huh. And they had about 20 houses. Paul Anka used to have a house on the country club. And it was a Tropicana country club. And MGM bought it. And that's where they built it. And I lived across the street from there. Uh -huh. uh, I live right in that neighborhood where you see kind of how her apartment is supposed to be. Uh, Sonia is played by Sarah Shahai. Done a lot of work, a really good actress. She uh, was once a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. She's, She's also a, a descendant of a 19th century Shah of Persia, believe it or not. She's on a show now, Sex Life, it's called. Uh, she was in old school. She was in, which is a really good series if you haven't seen it, City on a Hill with Kevin Bacon. She was in the first season of that. Really good. Uh, I thought she did a great job in this show. Uh, she oh, yeah. was very believable. I really like, there's something very specific about that character that I, I I just really bought it. I thought she was very honest and really believable. Well, at first you don't know what she is. You think she's a hooker, but I think she's a stripper, student, half hooker. I thought she did a great job. I think she's very believable. There's a real specificity to this character, who she is. And the way she talks about Christopher, the way their relationship was, whatever it was, um, I think she's just really honest and really believable. I liked what she did. We find out she's a dancer and actually putting herself through college. Uh, she is, uh, doesn't, she offers Tony a drink when he comes in, a uh, Santa Margarita, Pinot Grigio, which. At one point, did you drink it? I know I drank it. Jim drank it. Uh, you drank it, it like it was uh, I drank it like it was water. <laughs> you drank cases of that stuff. Literally like it was water. Yeah. It's a very light white wine. I haven't drank it in a long time. You used to love it. 
I um, used to love it. Uh, and, and, and Sirico, that's what he's, you know, drinks to this day, Tony. Santa Margarita, Jim drank it. It's a very light wine that you could drink a ton of it. It's, you know, it's, you know, I'm sure for real wine people may not like it, but it's very popular. Uh, and she offers him that. That's what she serves him. He, she, he says, I got some news, serious news. It's about Christopher. He's dead. It's a car accident. She says, oh my God, that's fucking awful. But she's not that devastated. Uh, not that surprised she doesn't seem. Yeah, I don't know how close they were or whatever, or, you know, maybe she's not that surprised because she knew he was a, maybe she knew she he had drug issues and things. He asked, did he marry that girl who wound up leaving him? No, uh, he did have a daughter. He, she says it's good that he left something. She's great in this scene. There's a um, book on cats in her apartment, which, you know, later on there's that cat staring yeah. at Tony, and so yeah. that might be something there. Uh, Do you like she does cats? a great job. Do you like cats? I used to have a cat when I was uh, uh, around 21. I was living down in Greenwich Village. Um, we, used, my girlfriend, and I had a cat. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. But now I'm allergic to animals. I wasn't then. It, it, it happened like in my late 20s. I started getting all these allergies. I don't know why. I love animals. I just can't be. You know, I love dogs. I just because Willie around Willie them. loves you. Willie boy loves. I know he does. Every time he sees me, he he stares into his that tail. Camera. His tail was flapping away. I see that flapping you know. away. Now, uh, Sarah Shahai, who plays Sonia, like I said, she she uh, is in City on the Hill, the first season, which is a great series. Matt, our friend Matt Del Negro is on there, uh, and she's got a show on Netflix, Sex Life, and. She's done a whole bunch of work. She's really good. Uh, and, and Tony's just getting to know her. He goes and pays a visit. They have a drink. Uh, and uh, that's about it. She was friends with Christopher. I guess probably met him at the strip club. Maybe Christopher was there on vacation. And seems to be that could be a connection as we yeah, find out. Yeah, definitely. John calls Tony. Uh, I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm here at the school. The asbestos. It's backing up. I got to dump this shit. We're working I have on. to say, though, I you know, the fact that he's at Caesars, he's in this robe with this Roman theme. Uh, there is this thing of this emperor, this king. You know, he killed his relation. His mother was Livia, who was, you know, one of the emperors, Claudius's mother, I think, the emperor Claudius's mother, which David named her Livia based on that show, I, Claudius. And the character that uh, of Livia from that show, there is this image that I think they're playing with of this Roman emperor, you know, drunk with power, murdering his own relatives to stay in power, enjoying the fruits, you know, and the spoils of all this kind of corruption and and power run amok. Uh, I just see, you know, and he's high above the city that he's kind of ruling over. It, it was just kind of imagery that really I thought worked. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there was some pointedness to it. Uh, the last time I was in Vegas, probably your last time, we were there for a charity thing in June of 2019. Do you remember? I've always had, liked Caesars. one of my favorite hotels. Remember, we had suites that were like... Gigantic. I mean, I had one. We had different ones, but they were like, they could have fit 150 people in. I stayed and I didn't even use the living room, which was like... <laughs> Bigger than my apartment. You know, I know. They gave crazy. us, uh, we did a charity at Rayo's, which Rayo's is closing. The Rayo's in Caesars. We had dinner, and then we went to see the David Perico band, which we loved. Uh, at at the, Cleopatra's uh, Barge. Barge. That was a fun show. That was a lot of fun. They, they, they're now the band for the Oakland Raiders, the house band. At, yeah. Uh, they were they really know. fun. That was a good show. Uh, David Perico, but. Uh, we had suites, I mean, separately. Too. I mean, we could have fit a lot of people in there. Huh? They treated us very nice, yeah. Uh, and uh, so you're talking about the asbestos, and he's saying, you know, hold tight. You know, Phil won't let the Soprano crew dump the asbestos, and it's becoming it a problem. Uh, AJ, Jason Parisi, Kevin. They're, they're at the frat house, the yeah, I think, on the porch. Uh, you know, say let him pick it up. They're breaking bottles. Punks, punk ass. Uh, and there's a cyclist, 
And the key opens his door. The cyclist runs into the door. It's not. It's an accident. That's a great stunt, whoever did that. That would look yeah. very realistic. Yeah, you open dangerous. the door. You don't look at it all. Jason, you wrecked my fucking door. And they start beating up this poor guy. For no reason. Yeah. For no fucking reason. It's just terrible, terrible to look at. They are punk scumbags, these two. Uh, this is a hardworking guy putting himself through school. And uh, it was an accident. And they give him a beating. Terrible. Tony drives near the Tropicana again. He's going. Uh, pretenders again. Uh, we've used the Pretenders on The Soprano several times. This is the Adulteress off their second album. Uh, don't know if that's, you know, directly uh, related to the Sonya character because she used to be with Christopher. Now she's with Tony. I, I don't know. They're having sex. Another uh, pretender song from the first album, Space Invader, which we ha used that song in another episode, actually. It's the second time Space Invader by the Pretenders uh, is being used. She says, you remind me of Chris, um, who seemed sad, but I think you're actually sad. Uh, well, her being a stripper, you know, they're kind of like, uh, you know, some psychiatrists. Some, some, somewhat people say that guys go to them uh, just to talk to them and, and tell them their problems. And there's a lot of that goes on for attention. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a big strip club guy. I never have been. No, nor nor am I. No. You know, you know, Chris left the party. You remind me of him. Uh, he says, "Why would you bring him up right after sex?" Uh, well, I'm saying there's a certain type of guy that I don't run into on campus. She's a college student. UNLV is not far from the Tropicana. It's right uh, up Tropicana in Maryland. That's where Nevada Las Vegas campus is, where my wife uh, graduated from. Uh, uh, but where I dance, the accent, the clothes. Chris sometimes talked about some sad shit, like you said, but you seem sad. So she kind of likes that. Maybe back east guy that comes to town. Yeah, to she likes club. They're not like frat kids, you know. They smoke a joint. He brings up the peyote. You know, uh, I've been thinking, why the fuck am I here? You can get to that place. Now, I'm not a drug guy, so I don't know nothing about mushrooms or peyote or So peyote anything. comes from the cactus. Uh, I guess a flower maybe on the cactus, and they're hallucinogen it's a hallucinogenic drug that was used um in ritual by a lot of the um native tribes in um mexico and in you know the southern part of the united states like arizona uh, uh the uh you know native tribes in in that region and they'd use it for you know in rituals or shamanic rituals for i guess clairvoyance or seeing the future or just kind of seeing mind expanding on the mind and uh seeking wisdom i guess he says he always wanted to try but the responsibilities never allowed it. she hasn't done buttons in a while i remember when i was a bouncer i found you know at the end of the night you would go uh you know when the lights got up you know you would go and look around see if people left shit and i found a big big bag of mushrooms yeah, that stuff's not my thing. I like to be in control. Even when I drink, I'm in control. Well, right? that's a problem. You need to let loose. You need to give up control. I think so it would think really I help you. So you think I should fucking do peyote? Go to, uh, I, to what, what do you call it? Out in... Uh, in the sweat lodge in the no, desert, yeah. out in the desert. What, what do you call it out there? Uh, the desert? Uh, Verna Social Club on Mulberry Street. That's Mare Chiaro Bar. I walked by there yesterday. There's a big picture in the window of that Last Supper Sopranos thing. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Big, really big, right in the window of that place, right on well, Mulberry they Street. shot there a lot. Yeah. Great uh, old Butch, time bomb. Butch, Albie, and Phil. Tony says, you got to let go of the old shit. You got everything you want. And Phil says, not everything. Meaning? I think he means... Uh... I don't know what he means. I think he wants Tony. <laughs> I think he, he wants, wants a Tony. Tony. I, wants he Tony. wants Jersey. Is that what he means? Or, I think so. You yeah. know, because he still has a beef. The big beef is the Tony Blundetto. 
and the, his brother. But I think he wants Tony, and I think he's got a lot of power. It's gone to his head. He runs New York, and he thinks he can just take over this family. Well, I got to be honest. It. Tony, Tony's like a little nub compared to yeah. You know the Jersey family here is yeah. Like he's a thinking he could compared. fold it into the you know the New York family that he uh, that he runs without uh, a doubt. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and, and the things Tony does as a boss, to be honest with you, stealing the wine and small piddly things that I don't think a New York boss would do. Would ever do? No. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff like that. You know, uh, you know. Well, you want to get nothing to do with asbestos. Uh, Tony hangs up on him. This is me hanging up. Phil's a smart ass. You know, he doesn't like Chris either. Was it him or Johnny Sack that doesn't like Chris? Neither one, I don't think. Yeah. Doctor Vogel's office, AJ. You know, people walk around like this. All, all this is all something. They're fucking laughing, and nobody takes even one second to think about what's really going on. Said you sound depressed again. How could you not be? You have to be fucking nuts not to be. I mean, you have to have your head wedged so far up your ass that all you can see is your own face. Everything is so fucked up. Why can't we all just get along? Robert's from. very good in the scene. I liked what he did here. Rodney King, and he's upset. He saw these Jasons beat up this poor black kid for no reason whatsoever. Yeah, good job by Robert. Yeah. Sonia's apartment. Tony takes drug with Sonia. Tony uh, makes out with her on the couch, and he throws up in the bathroom. He stares at this white light. You know, I thought when he, 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 he throws up, which apparently happens. I've never taken peyote, but that's what I've read, that you do, you do throw up when you take it. And then after the puking is when you start to really trip. Uh, it's an interesting speed up you know the, they speed the film up as the dolly pushes in on him but he sees the light which is buzzing with this hum and it was reminiscent of when he was Ke kevin finnerty in the coma i was thinking of that when he was looking at the white light and then it cuts to the interior of the hotel on a somebody rolling this roller bag which was again very reminiscent of kevin finnerty i think they're making some connection there uh yeah he says at the white light uh, Caesar's Palace, they walk through the casino. They're fucked up. They're fucked up in a couple of little shots. First, it's a Pompeii slot machine. Again, we're talking about this Roman emperor thing. And then a, a, a cartoon-like drawing of the devil, which I think what I was saying before about Tony, there's something definitely satanic that has kind of overtaken him. And I think that was what that reference was. They go to roulette table. It's, uh, this, you know, same as the solar system. Now, what is he talking about? Then? I don't know. Uh, the same system as the solar system. Now, Both can you, do you think it's round, possible? Round and round and round. Do you think it's possible to tune into some psychic way of the kind of random wheel, of you know, random spinning of the roulette wheel? No. Just I luck. Complete luck. I think this is the one thing is complete luck. Yeah. You know, yeah, Blackjack I, takes some skill. Uh, Baccarat for sure. Craps for sure. You got to know how to bet. Money, yeah. money management. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, I think Baccarat, you could somewhat control money management, that kind of stuff. Right. I do not think a slot machine is no skill. Uh, unless you're playing, you know, uh, poker, then of course. That's you know, different. It's playing and, odds, yeah. Uh, and I think uh, roulette is just random. It's like spinning the big wheel, you know, you know, you know that that big one. Uh, put uh, Tony press it all. Sonya tells him to press it. You know, there's there used to be things. I don't know if they exist anymore. Things girls that were chip hustlers. That's oh, what they yeah. were known. I lived. My neighbor was a chip hustler. So they you you they'd kind of be at the table and they'd go they'd go sidle up to a high roller. Kind of that kind of thing. They would and play a little, maybe small stakes, or go to the bar, have right. a drink at the or bar. If you're next to a high roller who's winning a lot, they get giddy. The the the, the if you're winning a lot of money, that you get giddy and generous, and you start tipping, or maybe good looking girl, you throw her a few chips here, bet with me. And that this kind is of thing. and this is what they did. This girl was a chip hustler. This is what she did for a living. And for a living, for a living, go to the bar, hang out. She was good looking, not an escort per se, 
But then go meet a guy, come on, let's shoot some crap. She kind of coerces him into that, she starts winning. He gives it a ba ba ba, and then she scrams. Turns it, says, I got to go to the bathroom. She's gone. Cashes she's the, the chips, she's makes not a few bucks. To, she's not there to sleep with her. She's there to make a few bucks, you know? Sure. Yeah, Chip yeah, yeah. hustlers. I assume they still do it. And, and some guys are happy to do it. They have All some right. companionship. I'm shooting dice. She's bringing me luck. Blah, blah, blah. Not, it's not necessarily going to go up to his hotel room. You know? Sure. Uh, he, uh, there's something in him, Tony, that is is dead like a shark. Like I said that before, you know, and it's that evil that's just kind of, he cannot escape at this point. He's just, in, you know, indulged in too much. He laughs, wins three in a row, wins all this money, falls down on the floor, and then it cuts it's a, a very specific pointed cut here, making a point. He falls down, he wins his money, and then here's dumping asbestos into the water, basically the evil of Tony Soprano. Now you're poisoning the water, poisoning people. He's already a killer, and, now, and, why, and why this is who he 24? is. Why the number 24? What do you take of that? He hits 24, what, two or three times. What do you make of the number 24? Any significance there? No, not that I know of you. No, no. So I'm asking you. I don't know. Well, if that tw means two seven. plus four is six. Six, six, six. Maybe I don't know. But the second I, number wasn't I think twenty-four. You're, I think he you're hits twenty-four. Man. He he doesn't hit twenty-four three times. He hits twenty-four. What then it's twenty, and then what 24. number do you play when you play with thirteen? That's your number. Yeah, always. It's black. Do you play uh, the lottery? No. I don't play roulette very rarely. I don't really like it. I only like blackjack. It's kind of fun, roulette, when you don't want to think. I like to think. Well, you like to think, but the people will fucking heckle you. They don't like playing with you because you I don't tennis. care. I don't I, care. I know you don't care. <laughs> I really don't care. It's my money. I can do whatever the hell I want. Michael and Pierre motherfucks the gamblers. That's right, exactly. Fuck them. If you don't like to gamble with me, go to another table. Go to another table. Exactly. Uh, Without a doubt. We're in the desert. Tony and Sonia watch the sunrise. Uh, Tony, I get it. He's screaming. I get it. He sees the white light. The sun coming up again with the white light. Out what does he desert. get? What do you think he gets? I don't. I don't know. I don't know. What could he get? From that? I don't know yet. How, then is he, how he's crying. I get he's happy. He's, he's sad. He's guilty. Is he full of joy? Is he full of guilt? Is he full of sadness? Uh, it's I very don't know. strange. What can, what can he get? What the meaning of life from that? Why? That's a good question. Write that down for David. What does he get? Andy, write that down. A couple of David questions. The suffocation yeah. reference from the from the intervention and the actual suffocation of Christopher in this episode. What did he get? I want to ask David that. That's a really good question, Steve. What did he when he says he got it, what did he get? I uh, don't, it, I also you know, so he goes out there, he makes this trip. He's got to feel like shit with this peyote. This got to take a few days to wear off. Oh, yeah. The crash from that's probably horrendous, yeah. yeah. So your final episode. Uh, Ends with a song by Calexico, really good song, Minas de Cobra. Oh, they're great, good. Calexico. Yeah, very good. I, I enjoy their stuff. It's not the first time they've been used uh, on the show. You know, uh, but like you said, I wasn't. It was your last episode, so you weren't around. You didn't come around. Was it your last day on set? Did you come to the last read through? I don't remember. Do you remember? You notice I don't remember a lot of shit. Yeah, I do. I do know that. I have so, a bad memory. What's the story with that? I I have good uh, short term memory, not long term. So you think you're gonna go for bit someday? Be a candidate for Alzheimer's? No, I don't think so. You remember your lines when you study lines. 
Yeah, I have good, really good short term memory. You remember? I just your, don't, you know. You this remember stuff. your stories on the our live conversation with the Soprano show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember uh, my all my lyrics when I perform with my band. Uh, you know, so I don't know. I just, you know, the kind of details that don't seem important a long time ago. I, I don't think I went back to the set. When I was done, I was done. I didn't go to the last week. I, I, I don't like it. visiting a set if I'm not working. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. Great episode. I'm sorry yeah, it was your really last good one. one. I mean, let me know if you're going to continue the podcast. If not, I got to start. I, I got to think about it, okay? I, I, I really got to start doing the search. You, you know got what I mean? Andy. Andy, believe me, Andy will jump right in. This fucking yes. Andy turned. Andy He's turned, raring to go. He turned evil. He was such a nice, innocent guy. Turned evil. Fame. Fame is a great corrupter. You know, yeah. Once he got on front of the camera, it was all over. Yeah. That was it. I know. But the, we're going to have a, Do you think we should have him on? I, the the Verderettes, his groupies. He's got fan clubs. The Andy, the, the Verderettes, they're called. Uh, uh, folks, if you want to see Andy on the podcast, Please. As a guest. As a guest, let us know. Let us know. Let <laughs> us know if you want to see Andy on the podcast. Let, let's talk out some stuff before we leave with a bit of taste in our mouth, Michael, okay? All right. Well, I, I think that's inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a done deal, uh, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right. Uh, now it's time for the Talking Sopranos Ask Me Anything segment. The winner of our AMA best question of the week is Laura from Chino, California. We're going to send Laura a pair of Bose headphones. Chino. Is it that? Uh, There's, a the yeah. There's a prison there. Yeah. There's a prison. Johnny Cash. Prison there. Right. Chino. Yeah. Uh, Laura asks, what does production do when an actor is ill with a common cold or flu? Are you expected or pressured to come to work if you are not feeling well? Is there such a thing as a sick day as an actor? Well, I mean, let's talk pre-COVID because everything changed with COVID. But very but good question. No one really good question. Uh, I have never missed a day of work. Wow. Ever. That's great. And um, unless you're in the hospital, pretty much you got to show up. You have a cold. I've gone to work with a cold. I've gone to work sick. You take medicine. They'll have. They'll call a doctor. They'll get. They'll do anything they can to get you in front of that camera. Yeah. I've had. I've had doctors come to set. I've had shots, B twelve or whatever. Uh, unless you you're in the hospital, you pretty much got to show up. Well, you know what, Michael? That was a while back. Nowadays, I think they're much more compassionate towards this. Of course, with COVID, it's a different story. Everything so changed. We're, with COVID. we're not talking yeah. about COVID here. Because, of course, if you're not feeling one, everyone's afraid that that's what you got. But, you know, I missed work last season on Blue Bloods for the first time. Before COVID? Before COVID. I, uh, no, last year during COVID, I missed two days of work. And uh, I missed a day this year. And they tested me over and over and over, and I didn't have COVID. They sent Dr. Uh, Who's our doctor? Katz. Katz. He came to the house, Dr. Katz. Uh, and they're much more careful now. I mean, I don't want to miss a day of work, and I've gone with colds and sore throats. You also don't want to get everyone on the set sick. No. You know? no. So they're a little more compassionate, even in the workplace these days where it was, you know, as an actor, unless you can't make it, you want to make it. You know what I mean? You want to make it. And, you know, uh, sometimes it's more critical that you show up. Like if, you know, sometimes they'll secure, say they're going to shoot at Tavern on the Green in Central Park, which is a very hard location to get, very expensive location. They've worked out that day. They only, you know, Yankee Stadium. You're going to shoot in Yankee Stadium, Madison Square yeah. Garden. That's a big deal. Really expensive. Lots of hard logistical things to work out. It's the only opportunity you go. It's going to be really hard to switch that or go back and reshoot it. They're going to really try to get you. If it's a day at the studio where yeah. they they own the, the location, they're always there. And the, yeah. they could juggle shit, of course. Well, they'll know? try. They'll do their best. Let me try to get so and so. We'll tag it on in two days. Hopefully, you're feeling better. Right. We'll tag it on the end of the day. We don't have that busy a day. But like you said, they'll try everything. If it's a huge location like that. 
And as an actor, if you give a shit, you will do everything you can to make it, you know what I mean? Whatever it takes, you know what I mean? Unless it's just, I mean, you're a, you can't get out of bed, you know, unless you're that sick, you know, with, with a bad flu and a fever, and you just cannot. If it's, yeah. you know, a little thing. But there are no sick days as an actor. And you're on call. Basically, if you're on a series, you're on call, basically. You're being paid per episode, and you are on call for the eight days or seven days, whatever it is. Of course, they could call you at any time, anywhere, because so-and-so missed their flight or doesn't feel well. We need you in tomorrow morning. Correct? Absolutely. 100%. You know? So you're and basically a, yeah. working. You know, you're working for those. They're paying you for those eight, nine days. You're... Better be ready to work just in case. You better be ready to work. And there's no sick days. It's not like you have 10 that you can use whenever you want. It doesn't work that way. And you're pretty much, unless you're really sick, you got to show up. That's it. Yeah. So good question, Laura. Enjoy your Bose headphones in Chino, California. Uh, Michael, uh, this is, what do we got, man? We got uh, three. Three episodes to go. Uh, the last three. Wow. Second coming, Blue Comet, and Made in America. That's all, it, that's all she a, wrote. That's, uh, and then we have Super Fan. We do have a Super but Fan episode. But we only have three episodes to break down. Boy, I don't know. I, I'm going to have mixed emotions. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, we're not there yet. Let's see. We <laughs> said we'd get. Listening. And remember what, so we, what we said we got. We said we'd get there to the end. We're go we're almost there, my friend. We're we said, you know. There, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening. Remember, new episodes are released every Monday. Please subscribe to the Talk of Sopranos podcast on YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast. If you haven't subscribed by now, fuck it. Don't even fucking bother, to be honest. Uh, follow us on Twitter <laughs> and Instagram. And if you want to like us on Facebook, <laughs> like us. If you don't, Fuck you too. Uh, right now, <laughs> you can get official Talking Sopranos uh, merchandise on TalkingSopranos.com or through our YouTube channel. <laughs> if you haven't subscribed by now, don't even bother. That, I don't think anyone's ever said that on uh, on a podcast. Uh, our executive producers, Jeff Sussman, producers Andy Verderam, our music was composed and performed by Elijah Amiton. You can hear more of Elijah's music and the band Zopa, which Elijah and I play in together by clicking the links at TalkingSopranos.com. Our production crew includes Ty Verderam and Sierra Sharippa. Talking Sopranos is a Pod Jams production. If you haven't subscribed by now, don't even bother. Fuck it. <laughs> all right, man. Uh, three more to go. God damn. All right. Yeah, all right. Let's see what happens. I hope we make it to the end. We'll see. <laughs>